All right, open up our Bibles, please, to John 20. John chapter 20. We'll go ahead and pray and ask the Lord for some help uh, this morning with our Sunday school lesson here. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for this chance for us to come together to learn more about you and your work. And Father, I just ask you to fill us with the Holy Ghost to be able to illuminate us and teach us with regards to the first eyewitness of the resurrection this morning. And Father, I give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for the salvation that you gave through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And this morning we're going to continue our studies here in the Gospel of John. And last time we were in John 20, we saw the objective evidence of the resurrection. And we went ahead and exposed uh, verses 1 through 10 of John 20 um, in order to see that uh, Peter and John and Mary, they actually saw the empty tomb. They objectively saw this historical reality and that didn't get them saved. Okay. And so this morning we're going to continue in John 20 and... Notice what happened with the first eyewitness of the resurrection, and we'll notice the difference between solely receiving the objective evidence of the empty tomb and actually seeing God. Okay. And so we're in John 20. I'm going to go to verse 11, please, and we'll read through verse 18, and then we'll expose what the Bible says. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, uh, because... Peter and John they actually went back home, so the butter there is saying that Mary actually stayed in that same area. Okay. Continue verse 11. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. So she still believes or is following the testimony she had earlier that she gave uh, to the disciples. She could, or it's the body of Jesus. Verse 14. And when she had said thus, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, Tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself, and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. And so we see that Mary, a woman, is the first eyewitness of the resurrection. First one to recognize Jesus when he spoke. Okay. And so let's go ahead and look at verses 11 and 13. Okay, where we saw that Mary was still weeping in front of the sepulcher and she decided to go in and saw two angels sit, sitting in the place where Jesus had laid. One at the head of that location, the other one at the feet. So you have two angels sitting, okay, separated, and there's a space where the body would have been, okay, and they talk to her. Now this is interesting because it's kind of like Mary, when she walks into the tomb, she's seeing an illustration, a picture of something very important. Okay. Go to Exodus 17. Exodus 17. And John 20 is a really interesting chapter. Not only does it show why the Gospels are the Gospels and not just biographies, but it has a ton of pictures, a ton of types, and a ton of fulfilled uh, shadows in the, of the Old Testament, fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And in Exodus 17, if you go, or I'm sorry, Exodus 25, I actually gave the wrong chapter, apologize. Exodus 25 and verse 17, the Bible says, and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work. Thou shalt make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. So the head and the foot of the seat. You have two cherubims, two heavenly creatures. And she saw two angels there. Okay. And then we'll go ahead and skip to verse uh, 
21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. And we know that the glory of the Lord sat on, on that mercy seat in the most holy place in the tabernacle. And that's where people would go, specifically the high priest, to commune with God. Okay? Now, the Lord isn't there, okay? but we saw that the Lord later talks to Mary and meets her in that area. And the idea being here is that now we have a testimony with these two angels, these two creatures sitting on a seat, the place where the body of Jesus had been. We now have, are looking at a testimony of the reality that that same Lord that had to stay in the most holy place, because he didn't want to destroy everybody with his presence, right? That same Lord now has made a way for him to interact with us directly forever and ever. And that's what the resurrected Jesus was the guardian. God. So we see this picture here, and Mary's coming in, He's she's recognizing the reality. Yes, the body isn't there. And now we have two heavenly creatures, two angels, speaking with her. Yeah. Now spiritually, this connects with the reality that many people today are looking for angels. They're trying to find a way to talk to angels, aren't they? Yeah. Or they're looking for religious relics, like the mercy seat. They're trying to find their shroud of Turin. They're trying to find their really nice-looking chalice, okay? This was touched by St. Peter, all this kind of stuff. If I get close to this, I'll find God. Okay. Well, here's Mary, who was closest to the greatest religious relic ever, okay, the tomb, the empty tomb. And in front of two angels, and notice that was the last thing she was thinking about. And she didn't find God there at all. Okay. This is why John 20 is a really good chapter to use with people for witnessing. And get them to see these things and think about them. Okay. The reality is religious relics and even a visit and speaking with an angel isn't enough okay, to actually come to Jesus Christ. That's the point I'm trying to show you. Go to 2 Kings 18. 2 Kings 18. I had a religious experience when I was near that holy sepulchre over there inside of Jerusalem. Not enough. Did you really find Jesus? 2 Kings 18 and verse 1. I'd like to show you here that in the Old Testament, people seem to understand that religious relics weren't enough. Okay. And in 2 Kings 18 and verse 1, to give you context, the Bible says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Verse 3. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. So this king did the right thing. And it was in God's presence, in God's sight, he did the right thing. And what was that right thing? Verse 4. He removed the high places, and break the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serving that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushan, okay, which means just a piece of brass, people. It's an idol, okay? He broke it. He made sure they understood that this is not what's important. You need to find the Most High God. You need to find the God of Israel. Okay. I don't know. So we can see that a good king, somebody who did that which, which was right in the sight of the Lord, recognized that those religious relics were not enough. Okay. They're not going to lead you to God. And he took the next step and broke them down. Okay. Mary, when she was walking through, she might have saw the relic, but she did not take that into account for her saying, oh, I found God. No. Instead, she's asking the angels, who has taken my Lord? That's who she's looking for, you see. Now, what about us in the New Testament? Go to Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Is this a problem in the church? Hmm. Colossians 2 and verse 18. This is Paul talking to believers now. And he says in Colossians 2 and verse 18, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. There you go. Intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshy mind, and not holding the head with the capital H, which is Christ Jesus, the head of the church. Right? 
So Paul is warning Christians, don't lose sight. Keep your affection on things above. The person is at the right hand of the majesty on high, not on angels or other stuff. And you might say, well, I'm trying to do that preacher. And I'd be like, amen. But most of Christianity ain't. Okay? I have family who's more worried about their angels and their little angel statues and, oh, I got the blessing from the angel and everything else. And I think that this person's saved. Okay? That's just a lot of the doctrinal mess that we have in 2021. Okay? If only she read Colossians, which is written to the church in Colossae, which is in the location of Laodicea, and she took it to heart, maybe she'd get off of that doctrine. Good luck getting her to actually consider the scriptures. I tried. Maybe the Lord will have better, better luck with a different Christian. I don't know. Not me. Who am I? I'm, you know, I'm her nephew. Right? <laughs> who am I? I've seen you in the past. Prophet isn't accepted in their own country. All right? Well, thank God there's other Christians out there to, to help. Amen? Point is, if you're a good Christian, okay, like Mary, you're going to see the angels. Or if you're a good Old Testament saint, okay, like Hezekiah, you're going to see those just relics and you're going to say, that's not enough. That's not what you want. You need to find the Lord. Okay? Now let's look at the eternal truth here. Go to Psalm 62. Here's the reality of the heart, what God is actually looking for in each and every one of us. It doesn't matter where you are dispensationally. Psalm 62 and verse 5, the Bible says, My soul. Okay, this is a Psalm of David. Okay? David's a man according to God's heart. So this is what God is looking for in the heart of a person. My soul, wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. You can't have two rocks, okay, Catholic. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. How can you say that, man? Well, I used to be Catholic. I threw the other rock out. I realized it was just a pebble. Verse 8. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, not the religious relics, not the angels which are messengers of the Lord, but God himself is your refuge. Salah, consider that, think about that, rest on that. That's what Salah means. Okay. And it seems like Mary, despite her sadness in the moment because she couldn't find the body of her Lord, she goes in and sees something that most people wish they could see in 2021, and she says, none of that's enough, where's my Lord? She seemed to have the right perspective, do you? Let's go back to John 20, please. John 20. And we'll read verses 14 and 15 now. Verse 14. And when she had said, uh, thus said, she turned herself back. So she tells the angels that somebody's taken her Lord, she doesn't know where he is, and she turns around, basically, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And we see that Mary supposed Jesus to be the gardener of all things. This should trigger some items in your mind, Christian, from Genesis, right? Go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Once again, the Lord died in an area that had a garden, okay? Not, not some pretty building around it and all this stuff. Let's leave it at that. Genesis 2 and verse 15 the Bible says, And the Lord God took the man, that's Adam, and put him into the Garden of Eden to do what? To dress it and to keep it, to be the gardener. And Mary turns around and supposes Jesus to be the gardener. She doesn't recognize him, but she does see him. Okay? So this is how you can see Jesus without seeing him right here. Okay? Many people do that all the time. It's called the historical Jesus. They watch that on National Geographic, you know. Or you got... Your Mormon who sees a different Jesus, another Jesus, okay? they don't see him properly. They visualize him wrong. Okay? 
But this brings up the idea of 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 and 47, where you see that the first man was made a living soul, but the second man was made a quickening spirit. The first man, Adam, was of the earth, and the last one, Jesus, is the Lord from heaven. And the Lord fulfilling all this typology. He's bringing the substance here as the gardener. And notice he comes and commences a conversation with Mary to try to help her with her grief. That's the God we worship, ladies and gentlemen. He's a God who comes to us and wants to help us in our sorrow, give us comfort in trying times. Okay? And in her case, he wants her to see him. Because even though he's right there in front of her, she can't see him. Okay? Amen. Has that ever happened to you? Okay. I lose my keys, they're right in front of me. Okay. I end up looking for a half an hour. Can't find my keys. All of a sudden, my wife says, look, they're right in front of you this whole time. And they're right there? What's wrong with me? Okay. Because my mind was caught up in other stuff and I couldn't see what was right in front of my face. Okay. She was caught up with the struggle, the sadness of not knowing where the body of Jesus was and couldn't see him clearly. Okay. And so the Lord, in his kindness, in his compassion, okay, in his mercy, he goes and says, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Okay. And these are the first words of the Lord Jesus Christ after the resurrection. These are the first words that God gives each and every one of us. Okay? Woman, man, okay? why weepest so? thou? Why are you so sad? Why are you recognizing the reality of this, this present evil world and how terrible it is? And maybe you're starting to see your part in it, your contribution to that destruction. Okay? Whom seekest thou? Notice that. Whom? A person. Who are you looking for? Now, I like this because you can look at this and connect it with Genesis 3 and see a parallel between the two accounts. Okay. You see Mary come into the, this garden tomb, and she gets confronted by two creatures, angels, who ask, Woman, why weepest thou? And Eve, the first woman, she got confronted by a creature, the serpent, and started asking her questions and getting her to think. Okay, The wrong way, unfortunately. Okay. But if you look at what the devil say, 80% of what he said was true. The best lies have a lot of truth in it. These angels, because they're of the Lord, they just ask her, why are you weeping? That's as far as they go. Okay. And Eve, we know that she responded. If we were to go to Genesis, let's actually go to Genesis 3, verse 8. I'll have it there. Okay, Eve responded. And she responded and showed that she didn't really know her scripture that well. Okay. It's true for most of us. We're no different. I don't think that you're special. You can have the word right in front of you, still quote it wrong. Okay. And the Lord, or the devil, I should say, the serpent, he took the opportunity to take that and give his 80% truth to her to get her to make the decision to eat of that forbidden fruit. Okay. Now, he didn't, he didn't force her to do it. She chose. Okay. But the idea is this creature came and spoke and gave her something incorrect. And then, as we know, in verse 8, okay, Right after that, she convinced her husband to make the same decision, and he chose to eat. And you'd have to read other scripture to find out why. Okay, and that's an interesting study. Okay, but he wanted to die for her, but he did it in the wrong way. He's a type of Jesus. The Lord died for us; he did it the right way. Okay, and then when you get to verse eight, okay, you see the Bible saying, "And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day." And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Unlike with Mary, the Lord comes and speaks to Mary, and she ain't hiding. She's looking for answers. She's seeking. They're running away from God when they hear his voice. Verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. God. The Lord spoke to Mary, woman, while weepest thou, okay, and she responds, I don't know where he is. She's not scared. She's not afraid, okay? She's listening and responding and considering the words of God. Who are, whom are you seeking? Very different, okay? And we see here the reality that conviction can result in two different ideas when God starts speaking, okay? Either God speaks and you respond to him, under conviction, knowing that he's the only one that can help you. Or you run away from him and bring up excuses. Like the first man and first woman did. 
And this difference is the key to figuring out what's going to happen with your soul. Okay. Now, let's look at what Mary's response was. Let's read that again. Uh, in John 20. John 20, verse 15. I'd like to show you something. I'd like to show you that God really is a God of the heart. And it says in verse 15, after the Lord's question, She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Notice, she never mentioned Jesus once. Him, him, where has he been? The gar if he's just the gardener, why is she assuming that he knows where Jesus is? You see? See, the Lord, the Lord responds to this, okay? You don't need to be that specific when it comes to matters of the heart. The Lord knew exactly who she was referring to here. That's why he came in the first place to ask her a question, okay? And to me, this is an example of godly repentance, not to be repented of, 2 Corinthians 7, where you're responding and talking directly to God and letting him know the pains, the sorrows in your heart, and your need for Him. You're seeking Him. Lord, where are you? Help me find you. Okay. My first steps in conviction when I was responding to God, I was looking for Him. I didn't know who He was. I had no clue. Okay. I had already thrown out the Jesus of Catholicism. Like, it can't be Jesus. That's how I would put it. But who are you, God? That sincere look of the heart. Who are you? Where are you at? Okay. God knows. Verse 16. God knows. Him, him, where art thou laid him? Verse 16, Jesus said unto her, Mary. And now we see the Lord speak and give the name right there, Mary. And then all of a sudden, she turned to herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is the same master. Now she suddenly can see him. Isn't that weird? That's how it works with us, by the way. You see, when we're under conviction, we're just woman and man to God because we don't have that personal relationship yet. When that moment of repentance and trusting in Christ comes, then the Lord will speak to us by name. Now it's personal. Now there's a difference. See? Now, historically, this is tied to the children of Israel. Go to Isaiah 43. Remember, Mary is a Jew. And in Isaiah 43, verse 1, the Bible says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. That applies to every single person who's part of that spiritual Israel. Mary's one of them. And we see God calling Mary by name. And through that simple act of calling her by name, the power is there for her to recognize who's in front of her. She can see him now. Isn't that interesting? Okay. And this just gets us thinking about what happened in John 10 there. Okay? Where he's the good shepherd, right? He gives his life for his sheep and he calls them by name. And he gives them eternal life and they shall not perish. Okay? Nobody can pluck them out of his hand. Okay? His sheep hear his voice and they follow him. Because they know him. So you're seeing that interaction happening here being fulfilled, so to speak, historically. Okay. Now, I like this because what we're seeing here is that the first eyewitness tes uh, testimony of the resurrection came from a woman. So if somebody tries to tell you that God doesn't love a woman, you show them John 20. I mean, it's a ridiculous notion in and of itself, but people like to use the Bible to try to say that God reduces women and puts them in a bad place and run to the Old Testament, a certain verse that they misinterpret, and all this other stuff. Okay? This is about as simple as it's going to get. The first person that God showed himself to was Mary. Okay. And I'll tell you this, brethren. If Adam chose not to eat of that fruit and he ran to God for help instead, I bet you God would have died just for Eve. If it was just her, he would have done the same thing. Because he loves women that much. Yeah. This is the reality of our God. He makes sure he wants to rescue all the perishing and care for the dying. Because he's merciful. Yeah. And he wants us to be saved. 
And the key here now is the difference of that personal relationship. This is why Mary can see Jesus. She has a personal relationship with God now. She is, spiritually speaking, born again. And that's what happens. This is why, Christian, you find yourself calling Jesus the Lord all the time. You don't call him just God. Okay? No, he's my Lord. He's my God. Okay? You know his name. You commune with him. And he communes directly with you. Okay? He's not in the middleman. In fact, he made himself the middleman. <laughs> Mediator between God and men is the man Christ Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Okay. He made himself the bridge to connect us. Okay. So if you're somebody who thinks you need a priest or an Amman or a Buddha or something else or a guru, okay? no, you, you, need, you need Christ Jesus. He wants to be the one to connect you between God and man uh, right there. Verse 17, verse 17. John 20, verse 17. So Mary now recognizes and has that relationship. She's seen the resurrected Savior. She now understands why the empty tomb was empty. Okay. Why the body of Jesus wasn't there because he really did rise again. I bet you all those verses she heard in the ministry are starting to trigger in her mind here and there. The Holy Ghost bringing all this stuff to remembrance. Okay. Starting to understand the reality. He was, he was prophesying. He told me the truth that he would come again. So you can imagine the joy she had. She can finally see that this gardener was Jesus Christ. And she probably started running to him. But Jesus says in verse 17, Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. And if you keep reading, you'll notice the Bible doesn't say, well, Mary didn't care and ran and gave him a hug. No, Mary obeyed her God immediately. Okay, verse 18. Now, many people wonder, what is this verse about? Okay. A lot of commentaries about this one, right, preacher? What is this about? Okay, well, I'll give you some ideas. I think it's a bunch of things together. But once again, the Lord is the substance of the shadows of the Old Testament. He can fulfill multiple things at once. So why limit it to one thing? Which is what a lot of people do. That's where all the discussions happen in the commentaries. Okay? But one item here is you're seeing the fulfillment of the Feast of First Fruits. Go to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 and verse 10, the Bible says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And we can keep reading about that, but the idea is there's a feast of first fruits. Okay. And when you read this, you'll find out that the Lord doesn't establish the date here. You have to go to Joshua to find that out. And you find out it's 17 Nisan, three days after Passover. Okay. We're in the first day of the week, three days after Passover. We're in 17 Nisan here in John 20. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse um, 23, you'll see the Bible tell you that Christ is the first fruits. So he's the fulfillment of this. And the reason why he tells Mary not to touch him is because he's acting as the high priest. And as you know, the high priest, if they're going to go to the most holy place, they have to be perfectly clean and all this. It will just die instantly. But he plans to go up there and present himself as the first fruits. Okay? The firstborn of every creature. Okay? All this good stuff. And he ascends to the most holy place in the third heaven, the actual real one, and presents himself to his father. But not only that, go to Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16 and verse 15. Because most people think of this one here. Okay. I just happen to think first fruits is more direct because of the date and everything else. But this also applies. Leviticus 16 verse 15. In Leviticus 16, you have the Day of Atonement all explaining all this. 
And in verse 15 it says, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Okay. And you keep reading, you'll find out it's an atonement for the holy place. Basically, the Jews had to atone for all the stuff that was part of the tabernacle and the altar outside every single year. Okay. Now, Jesus Christ, he already died. He was a sin offering. He already did that. But he's got to present his blood in the most holy place. Okay. So this is why many people connect this moment when the Lord ascends, as acting as high priest, he ascends up and he presents his perfect sinless blood to the Father in the most holy place is where people get this from. And they tie this to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. I, I agree with this. Okay? It's not like I don't disagree. Obviously, I do. Hebrews 9. And verse 11. The Bible says, But Christ being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Yeah. Verse 23, same chapter. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered in the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, a.k.a. the tabernacle of Leviticus, okay? but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so he fulfills the Day of Atonement, and unlike the high priest, he does it once, and it's it. One and done. Okay? So if you think you need to kill Christ every week, and that's your doctrine, you're probably messed up. Okay? That doesn't seem to match Hebrews. It doesn't seem to match the reality of the work of the Lord. Okay? And so you can take this as a twofold fulfillment. The Lord had to go up and present his blood. In heaven, okay, on the mercy seat and sprinkler, doing his role of the high priest to show that sin was expiated permanently by his precious eternal blood, okay, that's without spot and without blemish. And then him, in his glorified body, he presents himself to the Father as the feast. He's the wave offering. Remember, he's the bread of life. He presents himself. And that's why he's the first fruits. He's the first one with that resurrected body, that glorified body. John 20, please. Oh, no. I forgot about this. There's actually another item. What, he what she told, or I'm sorry, what Jesus told Mary was to go to the brethren, go to those disciples, and say unto them that he's going to ascend to their God and their Father and his God and his Father, right? Yeah. This is very similar to what God tells us to do, to go preach the gospel to every creature. Okay. And so, go to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1 and verse 8. The reality is Christians today, just like Mary, are called to go preach the gospel, are called to tell people about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The reality that He's the only Savior, the only Redeemer, and that if you trust Him, you can be saved. And let's say you do trust Him. Yeah. You've believed on the words that were told to you, words that God gave to tell to tell you through those people. Yeah. And so verse 8 applies to you. Talking about Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's where that song comes from. Okay. Beautiful hymn. But the idea is the Lord is hoping that Mary now, yes, she went and gave a testimony about the empty tomb, told them about all these things. Okay. And they believed her testimony there. That's why Peter and John, they ran to the empty. They wanted to see, is the tomb really empty? Yeah. And the Lord is hoping that if he sends her again, because they believed 
her the first time that they're going to believe her again when she says, I have seen the risen Savior. Yeah. He knows, she knows that he is with them no matter what they say, right? Beautiful hymn there. And she, or the Lord wants her to testify this. And so the question becomes, what happens, right? Okay. Go to John 20, verse 18. John 20, verse 18. So Mary, being a good Christian, she doesn't ask the Lord why I can't give you a hug. I'm so happy to see you. None of that. Instead, the Lord told her a command. And she, in verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. She obeys immediately. Okay. And that he had spoken these things unto her. Yeah. And now we see the chain's message now. Now it's not, I don't know where the body of Jesus is. Now it's, I've seen the risen Savior. I am testifying of the truth of the resurrection. Okay. Now what happened when you saw the Lord, Chris? What happened when you were born again? Okay. Were you confessing to people your great grades at school? Or how you're a great engineer? Or how you're great at your job? Or how much stuff you do for the community? Or how great your church is and how much they do for the community? And all the people you feed with your food banks? Are you testifying that? Okay, well, most Christians will tell you that's what they're testifying. Christians. Yeah. You're supposed to be testifying 2 Corinthians 5. Let's go there. 2 Corinthians 5. And I know when I got born again, I didn't know any Bible. That's the first thing I told my parents. You need to get saved. Jesus Christ saved my soul. I didn't know what I was doing, but turns out it's written down here. Isn't that interesting how the Holy Ghost can still give you scripture and get you to fulfill it even if you don't have a clue about it? Praise the Lord. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. I had no arguments. I had nothing. You know what I had? The testimony of God that I saw him living right here. That's all you need to give Testimony of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You're seeing this giving. As the Lord tells Mary, go and tell them that you've seen me, and that I'm going to go and ascend. Okay? Tell them these things. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God had beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And when we go give the gospel, that's what we're doing. We're asking them, recognize this reality in your heart, not just in your mind. Trust in what the Lord did for you at Calvary, and you'll be reconciled to God. Because God already made the way. But reconciliation is a two-way street. We have to turn around. Just like Mary, who turned back and saw her Savior, we need to turn back to him. Now, she was faithful, as it says in John 20. She gave the testimony. What happened? Okay. These were the same brethren who believed her just a couple verses back. So go to Mark 16. Let's take a look. Our preacher's smiling because he already knows. And anybody who's read Mark 16 knows. And even if you haven't, you probably have an idea at this point. But in Mark 16 and verse 9, you'll see the common response of anybody who hears the gospel from you the first time. I did it. Okay. I'm guilty. Yeah. It took me at least eight or nine times to even start thinking about it, I imagine. Okay. Mark 16 and verse 9, the Bible says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first. Oh, that's a good verse, by the way. Was risen early the first day of the week. That's part of why I think the Lord rose Sunday at night, which is the early part of that day. But anyways, continuing on. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. I love that. I've never even seen that before. It's really good. Okay. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So, the Bible telling you who this person was and how the Lord really saved her. Okay? Reminding you, the Lord can save people who are really dire in the dumps. Okay? Many great testimonies from people who used to be involved uh, with items and sex trafficking, all these types of things that could involve devils. Okay? The Lord can save to the uttermost. We have no business deciding who deserves to get saved. Let's just give the gospel out. Okay? Verse 10. And she went and told them, as the disciples here, the brethren, that he had been with, or that had been with them, Okay, so tell you who the brethren are, as they mourned and wept. And they, 
when they had heard that he was alive. So she told them, look, he really has risen from the dead. It's right now what he did, he wants to ascend. Okay? Under his father and your father, under his God and your God. That's where he is. He's going to, don't worry, we'll get to see him. I saw him. Now, now they, they believed her. Same day. This is what, same day. This is not that much farther in time. Okay, it's, and bring this to account. Remember, she ran, told the disciples, hey, I can't find the body. Peter and John run over there. Okay, so maybe an hour or two maybe passed, depending on how slow Peter was. He was huffing and puffing, right? Okay. But she stayed out there. She was crying. He, they went home. Okay. Then she sees the Lord. Okay. And he goes up. And maybe it takes an hour or two maybe for her to come and find the brethren there. She knew that Peter and John went home. They're crying. Again. What happened? Peter's still confused. And look, I saw him. He rose from the dead. He did it. And he went to ascend to the Father. He'll be back. Verse 11. Okay. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Now, that's usually what happens. Okay. Okay. Proverbs not accepted in their own country. She's like their sister at this point. I'm not going to listen to her about this. Now, it's weird, right? Because they listened to her about the empty tomb, but they didn't want to listen to her about this. She had been crying about not knowing where the body of Jesus was. See? And now, all of a sudden, she tells them, I know what happened. He rose from the dead. They don't believe. Now, for those who wonder why the Lord upbraided the disciples, now you know why. See? Now that makes more sense. Why didn't you listen to her? How, how could she just magically turn into have this, this joy from this crazy sadness to this crazy joy, unspeakable and full of glory at this moment? How could she change that quick unless what she's saying is legitimate? Why didn't you believe her? You were just at the empty tomb. You saw the objective evidence. How come that wasn't enough? Now I gave you an eyewitness and that wasn't enough for you. Oh, is it because it's from a woman? I think it's perfectly balanced. There was a woman who convinced a man to do the wrong thing. Now it's a woman trying to convince men to do the right thing. I think that makes perfect sense. My wife convinces me to do the right thing all the time. I don't, I don't always do the right thing, okay? I need, to, I need to learn. But we should listen to women, okay? But we see here the reality that all of a sudden when it comes to this spiritual truth, the truth of the resurrection, the truth of the prophecy that the Lord gave to them directly multiple times we've seen through this entire gospel, they didn't get it. And you know what? I probably wouldn't have gotten it. He rose from the dead? What? I know about the resurrection in the future. What do you mean he rose now? Yeah. I know I saw him raised from the dead at least three different people through the course of his ministry, but he rose himself? What? So we get it. We get it. And that's why the Lord continues in John 20 with the second group of eyewitnesses of his resurrection, which are those brethren. Okay. But you know what? You can have joy unspeakable and full of glory now because you can believe without seeing through this book. Okay. The Lord ensured you had more than enough evidence. Okay. He gave you the more sure word of prophecy, which Peter said this is better than what he saw. Do you recognize that? Yeah, preacher, catch me looking at the time there. So, there you go. First eyewitness. Yeah. Let us pray and we'll open up for questions. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us the first eyewitness of your resurrection. Help us to recognize that we're just like Mary when we go out and give the gospel at times. And the reality is people aren't going to believe us. But you send us out there to plow, Lord. You send us out there to start a crack in their heart, so to speak, so that you can continue to work your truth in by your spirit and by your word, so that they one day, maybe years and years later, they could wake up. Or maybe they could wake up just like the disciples do on that same day. Who knows, Lord? This depends on their situation. But just help us to recognize the reality that we have had the blessing to see you, just like Mary did, and help us to walk with you and obey you the same way Mary did here in John 20. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for the salvation that you gave through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Any questions or comments? Does it have to be about John 20?